morning. It's just about noon and I am your host for this Facebook Live, Dr. Polly Kyle Mealy with Abundant Health and Wellness. Now we are located in downtown Humble, Main Street and Avenue C. So if you are in the area, come by and see us and uh, we'll be happy to help you. Now I read a good deal and this particular article really just um, stopped me in my tracks here. And so I just wanted to kind of uh, reach out to you on this because this is just crazy, okay? So this guy is a health and wellness writer. His name is um, Gid, G-I-D-M-K. So I know that's not his real name, but that's how he signs himself. And he says that he's a health nerd. So I really wanted to read this and see what his opinion was. So this is kind of tongue in cheek, We're just gonna, we're going to talk about it because it's important. He says that wellness, right, as it is uh, defined, is an umbrella term for pseudoscientific health interventions. So pseudoscientific health interventions for wellness, I don't know that I definitely, you know, necessarily agree with that, but he says if you read wellness articles, you'll see everything from yoga to bullet proof coffee to infrared saunas, right? And I do believe in infrared saunas. I think they're good. I've not tried the bulletproof coffee, but I don't have a problem with it. Yoga, you know, that's not my cup of tea, but if you want to do that, that's entirely up to you. And then he goes on and he says, wellness is almost entirely a scam for rich people. Okay, so that really just knocked me back because I think everybody can attain wellness and I don't think that it has to do with how much money you make. But he says that the World Health Organization defines health as a state of complete physical, mental, social well-being, not just merely the absence of disease and infirmity. And I would agree with that, but I would also say that financial health also is part of wellness because when you are struggling financially, then you've got a lot of uh, mental anxiety and that kind of thing. So I think that's really, really good. He said, it's a good definition. Being healthy is not just about disease or injury. It's about innumerable separate parts of our lives that work together for us to enjoy our existence. He says, the problem is what happens if you're already at the top end of the World Health Organization's definition. If you live in a wealthy suburb, of a wealthy state and one of the wealthiest countries in the world. No one is 100% healthy, but if you have access to fresh food, fresh water, you're vaccinated against infectious diseases and you're already better off than a significant chunk of humanity. And I would say that that's probably true, barring the vaccination part. You know, we don't believe in vaccinations. But if you have good sanitation and good water and plentiful food, you are doing much better than the rest of uh, the population here. He says, wellness was demonstrated amazingly well in a recent Times article that went viral. It was a wonderful example of what happens when people who are both wealthy and interested in their own well-being, they go ra down rabbit holes in search of a perfect life. This is absurd nonsense. You know, which I don't, I don't necessarily, I think he's making fun of it, but this is an article that is really designed to say that if you have good food, you have good water, water then and you make enough money then you don't need to be worried about your wellness he says no one is 100 percent well which i can definitely agree with that and it says that health is under your control which is a fundamentally flawed idea that you can't do anything about your genetics and if things are in your family you're going to just have to have that well i don't think that that's true i think that there is a science called epigenetics that can take your genetics and change your genetics. Your genetics are what you're born with, but epigenetics is the way you live your life. It's the kind of food that you eat, it's the kind of water that you drink, it's who you love, it's what you think. It's all of those things that contribute to how we have our gene expression. So if you are a negative person, if everything is, is headed downhill, 
If the glass is always half empty, then I do think that you're going to have more negative expression in your genes than if you are someone who is very positive, who always thinks the best, who always sees the light at the end of the tunnel, who sees the glass as half full. I think you're going to express your genes in a very different uh, mode. He ends with saying, there is no supplement for poverty and poverty is what keeps people ill. I don't necessarily agree with that. I think that some of the people who are the poorest people who eat off the land and have uh, that, a more rural existence, they may not have all the stressors that we have. They don't have the financial issues that we have. They don't have the uh, environmental EMFs and all that kind of stuff that destroys your peace. So I'm just saying, I think this is kind of a spoofy article here. Um, he says, um, for example, if you're not being admitted to the hospital, chances are most of your organs are doing a decent job already. Well, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that because we have technology here and we are looking at how your vibrations, how your organs are resonating, and we know that that is not necessarily a good thing. So just going to say out there, this is kind of a tongue-in-cheek piece. I'm not sure uh, what he was trying to accomplish here. The final bit of his paper says... Um, uh, it's a good idea to check in with a doctor to see if there are any downsides to your wellness program. It's not always easy, but it's far more useful than wellness. You know, I don't know. I think wellness is a passion. I think wellness is something uh, that you do every day. In fact, as you guys know, I'm a Christian. I've got this big cross behind me here. And I really believe that Jesus leads us into all truth. I believe that divine health is a birthright, especially if you are a believer in Jesus Christ. But I also believe that divine health is like manna. It's what you do every day. So your wellness may not be necessarily the food you eat, the supplements you take. It could just be a mindset. But if you have the right mindset, you're going to make good choices. You're going to be mindful. And I think that that's where wellness starts. So just going to throw that out there. Now, what I really want to talk to, about today is something called fasting. And there's a lot of uh, information out there on intermittent fasting. And so I want to kind of talk about that. Now, just so you know, I fast every week. I do a 24-hour fast. And I have been doing this for almost 20 years, okay? My body knows that there's a certain day of the week it's not going to get to eat, and it doesn't really bother me much anymore. And um, I was interested in this particular um, um, article because it says it's focusing the latest science on four of the primary benefits of fasting. Eating less frequency for improved wellness. Oh, here we go, wellness again and longevity. Now, I definitely believe that we die too young. I believe that we should live a good long life. We should be a good example to the younger people on how to uh, grow old with grace and ease and still have your energy and that kind of thing. So I was really, really intrigued with this. And so these are scientific studies. And the guy's name is Alex Goik, G-O-I-K. You can look for him um, and you can Google him and whatnot. And he says, uh, I am not a doctor. Don't start this. Don't do a fast without checking in with your medical doctor. So I'm just going to throw that out there. Okay. Fasting. We're going to talk about fasting. And I, I meant to find a book. We've just been so busy here at the clinic. I haven't been able to find a book. But I have a book. It's an ancient book. I mean, it was written, I think, in the 1940s. So it's really not all that ancient. But it has fallen apart. I asked Tracy the other day where it was. We couldn't find it. But I have it. And I make copies of it. So I know I have it around here somewhere. But it was all about the medical perspective of long-term fasting. And I did a long-term fast two years ago, and I was very, very impressed at the health benefits that I was able to, to achieve. Now, I'm not advising you to do that. I think you need to be checked out by a medical professional before you do a long-term fast. But I do think intermittent fasting is something that everybody can do. So, it says, fasting is typically achieved by ingesting no or minimal amounts of food 
and caloric drinks for periods that typically range from 12 hours to three weeks. Now, most, um, there are different kinds of fasts. There's a sun up to sun down. There's a 24 hour fast. There's a three day fast. There's a five day fast. Our church every uh, January does a 21 day fast. Uh, there are 40 day fasts. I've never done a 40 day fast. Uh, the longest I've done is a 21 day fast. And I was, like I say, I was amazed at the health benefits that uh, ensued from that. It says fasting doesn't require a lot of thought nor does it entail dietary restrictions advanced by the majority of contemporaneous diets. By simply restricting the periods that you eat within the day, it is both easy and convenient to fast. Now, fasting is not a be-all and end-all cure for every negative symptom in your life, and I would agree with that. I do think that if you're going to fast, if you're going to do a long-term fast, you need to think it through. You need to plan for it. You need to be in the right mental state for it. And so that kind of thing. Um, it says, with this in mind, he's going to walk us through the evolutionary uh, biological rationale for fasting. So he says that eating three square meals a day is a relatively new phenomenon for human beings. It says if our ancestors couldn't function when we were hungry, that we wouldn't be here. So it says for the 11,000 to 12,000 years that Homo sapiens have resided within agrarian societies, it's far surpassed by the nearly 200,000 years of our ancestors spent foraging and hunting. Now, I'm not too sure about all this, but the main thing is he's saying recently we've come to know that we eat three square meals a day. Back in the day, you had to go out and hunt for your food. If you couldn't get food every day, then you would necessarily be fasting because it would be that long of a time between, um, between foods, okay? He says, as early as the fifth century BC, the Greek physician Hippocrates recommended abstinence from food and drink for patients who exhibited certain symptoms of illness. Elsewhere around the world, fasting was used for religious experiences and cultural experiences. So we know, we know as Christians that Jesus fasted. We know that other religions fast. The uh, Islamic religion fast. The Jewish religion, they fast. So fasting is a religious practice. It's a cultural practice, but I think it's also a health practice, okay? First and foremost, it is important to note that the vast amount of scientific evidence in support of fasting has been deducted from animal studies, okay? The studies have demonstrated that the lifespans of organisms from yeast to worms and my mice to monkeys have been extended by dietary intermittent fasting. Research based on animal models have shown that intermittent fasting can forestall or even reduce and reverse disease processes of various cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and neurodegenerative disorders, okay? So, even though we don't have a lot of scientific evidence on humans, the adaptations to fasting, right, is very, very similar. They expect very, very similar results to what you get with animals, okay? So he said it would be erroneous to assume because the implementation of fasting in rodents resulted in a 20% increase in lifespan that we can expect to add a couple of decades to our own by doing the same. However, okay, I do believe that fasting is good. There are all kinds of longevity studies, right, that show that when people reduce their calorie intake, they live longer. There are people that study uh, anti-aging, and they've come to that uh, uh, they've come to that conclusion as well. So let's talk about the four positive. Um, benefits of fasting. The first one is autophagy, okay? A-U-T-O-P-H-A-G-Y. Autophagy is the, is the uh, process of cell purification and cleansing. It is an adaptive mechanism to stress, okay, in which a defunct 
or possibly harmful cell is consumed by its healthier counterparts, thereby serving to prevent and repair molecular damage. Now, I'm gonna link in this new information with information that you already know. In your lymph nodes, you have macrophages and you've got phagocytes. Now that P-H-A-G, macrophage, phagocytes, autophagy, okay? So if that P-H-A-G-Y, that means uh, in the immune system, in the lymph nodes, you've got these little Pac-Man creatures that eat up all the dead viruses and bacteria and all that kind of stuff, and that's how we stay healthy. When you fast, the body is conserving its energy. It's not using its energy to digest things. So it is taking a inventory of its broken cells, its tired cells, its impaired cells, and it's eating them up so that they are not going to be placing a burden on the immune system. So that is a good thing. Autophagy has been recognized as a crucial defense mechanism against cancer, malignancy, neurodegenerative diseases. More recently, it has also been observed to limit the replication of viral infections. So this is really, really good. The second good thing that it does, it is for fat metabolism and ketone production. Now, the adaptive mechanisms behind fasting involve a metabolic shift to fat metabolism and ketone production. Ketogenesis occurs when the body switches from utilizing glycogen derived from carbohydrates to utilizing ketone bodies derived from fat. So we've talked a lot, you've heard a lot about ketones. You've talked about uh, the keto diet. We've talked about ketogenesis. If you've watched any of our stuff, you know that we're all that and a bag of chips when it comes to the keto diet. What we don't like is when you go out and you buy products that say they're going to improve your ketones. Ket um, ketogenesis, and I'm sure I'm not even saying that word right, right? Uh, it is something that happens when you derive your, uh, deprive your body of carbohydrates and sugars. The body doesn't have a quick energy source, so it has to break down the fats to make its own ketones, and you go into ketosis. This is a natural thing. This is what the keto diet does for you. I am a fan of the keto diet, but I don't think you should do a keto diet every day of your life from now until Jesus comes. I just don't think that's a good thing. Dr. Tony Jimenez of Hope for Cancer Institute, who is a personal friend of mine, as well as a mentor, he says that for you to be cancer-free, you need to rotate your diet. So do a ketogenic diet for a while, do the paleo diet for a while, do whatever you need to do for a while, okay, and then rotate your diet. He says the more colorful your vegetables, the better your diet is, so just kind of take that under advisement. But when you do intermittent fasting, then you metabolize the fats that you store. So as Ladies, most of the people that watch us are ladies. Um, we are more plumptious than the men. Why is that? Because genetically, the body knows that we have to sustain life. We are the ones that get pregnant. We are the one that gestates the new life. And so the body is gonna make sure that we have a larger amount of fat store so that if we go into famine, we're going to be able to utilize the fat that we're wearing in order to nurture the infant. That's why women are more curvaceous. That's why they have more fat. And I like that. I am not a fan. And if you're one of these ladies that's super, super skinny and you have this high muscle mass, I'm just not a fan of that. I don't think that it's really feminine. I think women are supposed to be soft. I don't think we're supposed to be squishy, but I think we're supposed to be soft and um, cuddly, okay? So that's, that's my story, I'm sticking to it. So, um, in recent years, there's been a groundswell of interest in the benefit of a ketogenic diet, okay? So, ketones are considered a better source of energy for the brain because they cause less oxidative stress and they last for longer. So again, I am in favor of a ketogenic diet, but I'm not in favor of that being the only diet that you use the rest of your life. So, depending on an individual's level of physical activity, 
12 to 24 hours of fasting has been observed to result in 20% or greater decrease in blood sugar and glycogen stores in the liver. This is accompanied by a switch to the metabolic mode in which fat-derived ketone bodies and free fatty acids are used for energy sources. Now, <laughs> Carly, I love that. Yes, I have the, the soft and gentle side down as well. Okay, we like that. My late husband used to say that I was plumptious. So, because I would used to, I would say, honey, do I look fat? I think I feel fat. He goes, you're not fat, you're plumptious. So, plumptious is a, is a much more uh, lovely way to put it. Uh, I am less plumptious than I was. So, that's a good thing. Um, okay, it says, through this process, the ketogenic process, the majority of human beings are capable of surviving for 30 or more days in the absence of any food. So that's just something to think about, okay? So in a famous study in 1965, a morbidly obese male patient weighing over 200 kilograms, okay, so a kilogram is 2.5 ounces, no. Mm, I don't know, kilogram. Kilogram is 2.5 ounces. So you multiply, you multiply, you work it out. Ask Google, what is 200 kilograms? It'll tell you what it is in pounds, okay? He did that under the supervision of a physician and the fasting lasted 382 days, okay? By the conclusion of this study, the patient had attained what was considered a healthy physique. Okay, so I looked at this study, and he had lost, I think, almost 200 pounds. That was a lot. I looked at this. All right, so the third benefit of fasting is that it increases your levels of human growth hormone. Yay! Human growth hormone is a hormone that we produce when we're young. This is why children grow so fast. But then when we get to be in our 20s, we stop making as much of it. And then when you get to be as old as I am, there's hardly any that you're making. And so that's why we get old and that's why things stop working. It's because we're not making enough human growth hormone. So intermittent fasting gets your body to make more human growth hormone. So why is this important? Human growth hormone is great for weight metabolism. It's anti-aging. It's anti-wrinkles. Your hair will grow and be pretty. Your nails will grow and be pretty. You'll have greater muscle strength. You'll have greater endurance. So human growth hormone is very, very important. So it says that human growth hormone is a protein secreted into the bloodstream by the pituitary gland. HGH, human growth hormone, serves many functions throughout the body. It boosts protein production, promotes the utilization of fat, interferes with the action of insulin. Endogenous production of HGH typically peaks during adolescence and begins to wane as we age. During our latter years, I'm not quite sure what that means, uh, HGH deficiency is matched by reduced protein synthesis and lean body and bone mass, as well as increased body fat. So this is why we get more plumptious as we get older. It is therefore believed that a reduction of endogenous HGH production may account for one or more of the effects of aging, okay? Studies have proven that there are multifold increases in endogenous HGH levels when we enter into a fasted state. The body boosted levels of HGH is regarded as an adaptive stress response to calorie deprivation. It acts as a principal motivator to promote conservation. In other words, it Elevated levels of HGH encourage muscle retention during fasts and growth upon re-entering a post-fast stage. So, HGH is awesome. We just got this product. This is HGH, and it is transdermal. It is homeopathic, and it is 100% legal. Okay, the FDA 
Uh, it is FDA approved. It is for external use only. Don't ingest it. And what you do is you do a pump twice a day on the soft, thin skin of your body. And it helps you over a period of time. It takes three to six months for you to see the benefit. But it's very much anti-aging and it will help you live into your later years um, with a lot of strength and endurance. So that's something that we just have brought in to the clinic. I uh, got it, I think, two weeks ago, and uh, it's way too early for you to see any results. Uh, like I said, it takes three to six months to really see some results, but hopefully, watch this space, and we'll do a before and after photo in six months, and you'll see how we are, okay? So, fasting boosts the cognitive function, how your brain works, how your, your, your memory works, how fast you are on your feet, and that kind of thing, and it also helps with brain health. Now, as someone who probably would be deemed to be in the latter years, you know, I mean, I'm past 60 now, which I don't think is all that old, but a lot of people uh, would look and say, oh yeah, well, you've got Medicaid around the corner, or Medicare around the corner, retirement around the corner, so yeah, you're headed that way. I don't necessarily feel like that, okay? I feel like I've got probably 20 more years of doing what I'm doing. Um, maybe even longer, but I definitely can see me doing this into my 80s. So, um, you know, I'm planning on hanging around here. So, what I don't want to do is lose my mental faculty. I don't want to lose my brain power. So, the writer goes on to say, contrary to popular perception, humans retain and may even experience enhanced cognitive function when starved of nutrients for a short duration. The mechanism behind this trait is attributed to the increased signaling of brain-derived neurotropic factor, okay? That's BDNF. And so if you're looking at a paper, if you're reading a, um, a scholarly report from PubMed or something like that, you'll see these letters, BDNF. I always forget what BDNF means, so, uh, but it is brain-derived neurotropic factor, okay? And this is increased when we fast. You know, I wonder, when you look at the Bible, and the people that fasted, right? Daniel fasted a long time. Um, the uh, Jesus fasted a long time. We know Gandhi fasted often. And so fasting uh, elevates your mental capacity, okay? So we want to be able to do the things as we get into our older years that we're not going to go senile or demented. I mean, that would just be horrible. So BDNF, remember, brain-derived neurotropic factor, is one of five neuroproteins, a group of proteins that facilitates the survival, development, and function of neurons. It plays a vital role in the maintenance of the central and peripheral nervous systems. It acts as a master regulator of energy homeostasis, right? It encourages neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity means your brain can uh, form new patterns. Your brain can receive new information. Your brain can hook up new information to old information, neuroplasticity. So that's a good thing. It is your brain's ability to form new neural connections throughout your life. Conversely, diminished BND, BDNF signaling has been linked to age-related neurogenitive diseases, including Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, psychiatric disorder, and major depression. So if you're a little bit depressed, you might want to try doing some intermittent fasting, 18 to 24 hours, and um, just see if that helps with your cognitive function. Now, a lot of times when you're fasting, you do a multi-day fast, you'll have a detox reaction as the body starts to clear out a lot of the toxic load. So that is something uh, that you might wanna think about. However, we're really adept at fasting. I fast all the time, so I can really help you with fasting if that's something that you're interested about, okay? In short, by acting on the metabolic stress of the body, Fasting encourages the signaling of BDNF there, thereby. So, uh, the, was that the fifth thing? No, the fifth thing. There's a fifth thing in here. I've got to get to... Okay, the fifth thing is... 
I've lost the fifth thing. Number four, I'm not seeing number five. Maybe, I don't know, maybe you didn't put a fifth thing in there. Okay, so I'm continuing going on down here. Although the benefits cited above generally compound, the longer you fast, it is important to approach fasting slowly and allow you time to assess how your body is reacting. Do not expect to jump straight into a multiple day fast uh, and feel great. Indeed, the results of fasting trials in human subjects suggest that there is a critical transition of three to six weeks, during which time the brain and the body adapt to the newer eating patterns and mood is enhanced. Okay, so figuring out the right methodology to suit your lifestyle is key to making fasting a continued practice. Okay, so... Here is what they say, restricted feedings. So the circadian clock time, the biological clock or the circadian oscillating coordinating behavior and physiology, okay, is in accordance with natural daylight and dark. So what they want you to do, this is a way to fast, you only eat when it's daylight, okay? So that is one way to fast. So. Uh, with your restricted feeding, okay, it is, uh, let's see, finish eating as close to sunset as possible and maintain a minimum 13-hour fasted window. For those of us residing in the polar region where the sun might not ever set or rise, this might mean finishing dinner at 6 p.m. and having your first bite of food at 7 a.m., okay? So there are apps, you can, there's all kinds of help on Google and apps and all that kind of stuff. So starting out with a 13 hour fasted window is a good way to initiate your body into a fasting practice, all right? Then there's the 16-8 protocol, which is what most people do. This means that you have 16 hours of fasting and only eight hours of eating. So look at your day, look what works for you, Pick eight hours, you only eat during those eight hours, and the rest of the 16 hours you don't eat. Now, we call the first meal of the day breakfast, break the fast, because you have fasted all through the night. And we don't think about fasting through the night, but we do. So think about our ancestors, right? If they went to bed with the chickens, there was no electricity, you had candles and that kind of thing. If the sun goes down at six o'clock, then you, you've had your dinner while it was daylight, you go to bed, you don't get up until it's daylight, whatever time that is. So an 8-16 window is pretty easy for most people. So um, the fasting mimicry diet, okay, was created by Dr. Walter Longo, the director of the Longevity Institute at uh, the University of Southern California. Okay, he says that if you consume a low calorie diet comprised of specific natural ingredients for a period of five days, given the choice of ingredients and low amounts you consume, the benefits associated with strict fasting are not overly jeopardized, allowing you to reap many of the benefits of a multiple day fast. So you can Google the fasting mimicry diet, FMD. You can look at that and that is not strictly fasting, like you're not going anywhere, right? It is a little bit of food, very low calorie intake, right? And so depending on your health, depending on what's going on, you may decide to do that. I'm kind of an all or nothing person. If I'm gonna be fasting, I'm gonna be fasting, all right? This uh, diet, the fasting mimicry diet, is scientifically backed and in, is an endorsed fasting protocol, okay? So, fasting is a practice as old as our species, but many of the research benefits are only now starting to emerge, okay? Consult with an expert before you begin a long fast. Now, I'll just tell you, I did a 21-day liquid fast. A lot of people at our church do a Daniel fast. A Daniel fast just doesn't work for me because I run on protein, all right? A Daniel fast, for those of you that don't know, is vegetables and fruits. That's what a lot of churches do at the beginning of the year. Our church does that too. 
Uh, the pastor uh, asked that we participate in fasting. Maybe if we don't do the uh, Daniel fast, we could do something else. Anyway, I decided that I would do a liquid fast. I prayed about it. I wanted to do some fasting. I had read uh, Jensen Franklin's book on fasting. Someone had given it to me right before Christmas. And so I decided that I was going to do that. And I did a liquid fast. And so I did, I consumed liquids for 21 days and the results were absolutely amazing. Now, I am a healthcare practitioner and so I know what to look for and that kind of thing. So uh, I'm not advising you to do this without checking with your doctor to make sure that you can sustain a long fast. One of the reasons that I was able to do this is because I have a lifestyle of fasting. I have fasted, I've done a 24 hour fast um, since, Oh, almost 20 years, okay, at least once a week. I've had longer periods of fasting where I've done, you know, two to three days of fasting and that kind of thing, but this was the first time I've ever done a long fast. And so I, had, I, I was great mentally. Um, I did have some prayer requests that were attached to the fast, and I was amazed at the miracles that happened in my friends and family. My eyesight also improved, which I was not expecting. I was expecting to lose a little bit of weight, and I did, but my eyesight, I had to have my contact lenses changed because my eyesight improved because of the fasting. So there are a lot of good things to be had about fasting. Pray about it, think about it if you need any more information. I will be here for you. Just reach out and I love you. Take care. It's the weekend. It's Friday. So tomorrow starts the weekend and we are now in spring. So uh, get your spring cleaning done. Remember that uh, refers to the body as well as it does to our home. So love you guys. Take care. I will probably see you next week. I am headed out on Friday afternoon to a conference, so I'm not quite, quite sure uh, what time we'll do the Facebook Live, but it will either be earlier on Friday or it might be on Thursday like we did the other day when I was traveling. So be blessed. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for sharing. If you have any questions or comments, pop them in the box and I'll get back to them. Take care. Love you much.